for having me today. Um, taking a cue on that uh, mention of the microsystem seminar. While you're all captive, I'm going to do a little advertisement. You can delete all my emails without reading, me, reading them, but you can't get up and walk out of the room during the first slide of my seminar. So I want to advertise the seminar this coming Tuesday. Um, so it's on the 15th. It'll be here at 4 o'clock. Um, this is an exciting seminar. This, this really is. Um, I'm really excited about this. This, this guy, uh, Professor Ozcan, he's um, a few years younger than I am. I um, uh, was hired at UCLA in 2007 and is currently a full professor. So do the math on that and you will find out just how successful he's been uh, at UCLA so far. Um, so this is a, a little gadget that his group has, has put out there um, that they refer to as a lensless microscope. So they use uh, uh, holographic techniques, a lot of computational techniques uh, that are simple enough to run on smartphones and have essentially put together this little device that can serve as a sophisticated fluorescence microscope but out in the third world. So this will seriously be a very exciting seminar so I really recommend uh, coming to that one next week. Um, okay, so getting into my seminar now, let me introduce you to uh, what my group does. Um, where we're really interested is, uh, from the bioengineering angle, uh, focusing on disease. That's generally the end goal that we're usually looking at, is either trying to develop a tool that somebody can use to study disease, or a tool that can ultimately be used in a diagnosis. And the toolbox that we use uh, is micro and nanosystems. So nanosystems usually involves uh, making conjugates of nanostructures with biomolecules, uh, and at the micro scale, we work with classic microfluidic techniques as well as other microstructures uh, that we're interested in. I want to highlight two major research directions that the group has right now. Um, and then ultimately, we'll, we'll pick one to focus on in this, in this seminar. Um, so uh, I have uh, led a major research effort that we have with Canon Inc. Um, so Canon Inc. in Tokyo uh, has a subsidiary that has a subsidiary and so on and so forth. That ultimately leads to Canon Life Sciences in Rockville. So we started a partnership with Canon Life Sciences a few years ago. Um, ultimately, we actually report up to the president of Canon USA as well as the CTO of Canon Inc. Uh, in Tokyo, which um, is encouraging and frightening all at the same time. Um, and what we've been doing for Canon Life Sciences is developing a highly integrated microsystem uh, for, the, for infectious disease, di disease diagnostics, specifically looking at the very difficult problem of bloodstream infections, uh, which ultimately lead to sepsis. Um, so generally, how we do this today is it, by interviewing the patient, observing systems, and we try blood cultures, but quite frankly, blood cultures have a success rate of somewhere on the order of 30 to 50 percent. So flip a coin, would be actually more accurate in some cases. Um, so what Canon Life Sciences wants is an actually highly integrated, completely automated system that has the manual preparations of blood cultures, that is draw blood, insert blood into system, result comes out later. But what they want is an answer that comes out in two hours instead of two days to seven days. Um, so this has uh, a lot of need for innovation in terms of sample prep because we're talking about large volume whole blood samples that need to be processed in a microfluidic device as well as some sophisticated advancements on the diagnostic side because we want an instantaneous identification of whatever that bacterial species or that fungal species in the blood happens to be. So two difficult problems, so we've kind of looked at this as a parallel project. Um, Don DeVoe and I have mostly focused on the sample prep uh, side of this, of taking that whole blood and breaking it down into its components and ultimately pulling out the bacterial, the bacterial genetic components that can lead to the diagnosis and then handing that off to the other half of the project. Um, so this is now starting its third year of a three-year initial phase. Um, there's talks of trying to extend this and, and increase the effort uh, put into this project. Um, since we're in an ISR seminar, I want to focus on, when I can, what we mean, what, what it is that we think of as a system in our research components. Um, so in this case, um, where we really have to focus on systems integration here is we have to develop a lot of new 
components that will perform certain functions. So one component that will take in whole blood and quickly break it down, another component that will pull out bacteria and extract DNA, another component, that, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a, a lot of challenges at looking at the mechanical compatibility of each one of those components. And then on the bioengineering side, um, the chemical compatibility actually turns out to be quite complicated as well. So generally speaking, we like to publish lots of papers saying, I did this little component here and ultimately you could stick it in this grand system. But very rarely do you actually see the whole system become developed. And, and it's not just a matter of how much it costs to put it together, but really uh, the interconnections in terms of what kinds of flow speeds are necessary to do certain things, but also what kinds of reagents need to be exchanged somehow between each one of those steps. Um, so again, Professor DeVoe and I have been uh, working on uh, developing those components, always keeping in mind the greater picture and how ultimately that's going to be compatible in a system. Yes. Yes, of course. Do you have to first understand the, the genome of the patient? in order to make sure that you're not just sampling one of the patient's cells? So um, we are, of course, getting patient cells in there. Um, the, what, so I'll, I'll mention where Canon came into this. So they have developed a system that does microfluidic PCR for genetic disease diagnostics. Mm -hmm. And they said, OK, here's a platform. How can you modify it such that instead of doing human genetic diseases, right. we can do bacterial infection diagnosis based on the bacterial genome? Um, so fortunately, people have looked at this problem before us and the primers to use are already out there. So, but ultimately how you interpret the results plays into that and how the, the human genome interferes with the reaction plays a part in that. But the sequences are fortunately well understood already. Okay, so the second mostly independent track that I'll mention that we'll actually focus on today, um, mostly because Canon would uh, be a little bit frustrated with me if I told you all the details of what's going on there, but I can give you an overview. Um, but I, I'm going to dive in, into more detail um, in another technique that we are developing in the lab, um, which is chemical and biomolecule detection using a technique that we call optofluidic SIRS. So we'll talk about what exactly that means. Um, but there are two uh, mechanical substrates that we use for this. Uh, we have one line of work in which we use classic microfluidic devices and the other which I'll really emphasize today is utilizing paper as a micro device. Um, here systems mean something a little bit different to me. Um, in this case we were talking about looking at it as a string of ten components that we tie together and we have to think about how we can integrate each component with the next and so forth. Um, Kind of a new direction, new philosophy in microsystems, I think, is how can I look at the system differently such that instead of stringing together a lot of components that I have to mechanically interface with each other, can I come up with a single element that can allow all of those features in the system to be combined together. Um, and so we'll talk about how going from classic microfluidics into paper allows this to happen for some unique cases. Um, so what we'll focus on is this idea of an inkjet fabricated plasmonic sensor on paper as a substrate. And we'll talk about where all those components come in. Um, so I'm going to, the talk is kind of divided up into two sections. One that will first focus on uh, on-site chemical detection. This means going out in the field and doing chemical detection on the spot as opposed to shipping all the samples back to a, a central laboratory and doing the analysis there. Um, chemical detection we, we started with as a group uh, because it's a little bit simpler to do and quite frankly when you're a tenure track you gotta go for those easy papers to get out. So that's how it works. Um, uh, once we kind of mastered that and it was time to move on, then we go to uh, a shifted paradigm where we look at actually doing uh, biomolecules for diagnostic applications. So I'll start out with chemical detection, which really introduces you to the concept, and then get into uh, more so what we think about with diagnostics and how this platform evolves for that. So on-site chemical detection, we can make a long list of uh, applications where this would be great 
Um, we can think about going out and testing water and other environmental samples um, to look for uh, environmental contaminants, um, whether that means uh, toxins or pesticides, etc. Um, food applications, again, pesticides come up and other toxins that can cause problems. Um, defense, this is an obvious one uh, that probably doesn't need much attention. Um, as well as in moving into the biomedical space where uh, metabolites, which are also small chemicals, could be used for evaluating the health as well as um, looking at drugs and their interactions with patients. This is a long list of, of applications where it would be nice if we could do the chemical detection right there on the spot as opposed to shipping the sample back to a central lab, which is what we do right now. So right now in the central labs we have absolutely fantastic ability to do chemical identification in very, very trace quantities using HPLC mass spec. Um, so it's excellent de detection performance. Every crime show, every uh, medical show on TV, they've all got HPLC mass spec capabilities to identify whatever they want, and that's great. The one problem with that is on TV, it always happens in a few hours. In reality, uh, it's more so going to happen over the course of a week. Um, what we envision instead is being able to take a small kit and a backpack out to the source, do the testing right on the spot. Um, and really HPLC MS doesn't allow us to do that um, because of its characteristics of being large, bulky, way too expensive, sophisticated needs that it has. Um, so there are literally thousands of groups around the world looking at ways to address this problem. Um, I'm a photonics guy, so I'm going to pick a photonics tool set. So let's talk about one possible photonic chemical analysis tool, and that's Raman spectroscopy. So let's just take a moment and give a tutorial and see how this is applicable. So a uh, simplified explanation of Raman spectroscopy goes like this. Imagine a very simple molecule with two atoms. Those atoms have some binding energy uh, between the two, and in reality, uh, anytime that system is energized, just uh, for example due to thermal effects, um, you're going to get uh, some movement of those atoms. Because they're bound together, we can imagine that they're tied with a spring that they can oscillate back and forth. Ultimately, quantum mechanics tells us that uh, those uh, possible energy levels are quantized, so we call this vibrational energy levels in a molecule. If a photon comes in and excites that molecule up to a higher level, um, certainly one thing that can happen is that molecule can re-emit a photon at the exact same energy level, so we call that Rayleigh scattering. But because of the existence of these vibrational energy levels, uh, it's also possible for that molecule to emit that photon at a slightly redshifted energy. Um, now if you consider that uh, in the physical paradigm of molecules, each individual molecule has its own set of binding energies, therefore these vibrational energy levels are unique to every molecule. So by looking at the scattering uh, that comes off a molecule, you can uniquely identify it. So here's a, a nice model, rhodamine 6G. Anybody who does Raman, if they see this picture, they say, ah, it's rhodamine 6G. I know that one. That's a signature. Um, so this is what's nice about Raman. Hit it with a laser, look at what scatters back, and you see a signature. It can be very specific. Here's what's not nice about Raman. Um, these events are actually incredibly rare. Uh, Rayleigh scattering completely dominates. Raman is very rare. So while I can shine a laser at a bottle of ethanol and tell it's ethanol, if I want trace detection, which is what we're interested in, you can't just hit it with a laser and measure the scattering and identify that the chemical components there. Uh, so it's just not an appropriate technique for trace detection, which is what we're interested in. So the challenge then is, can we utilize that specific nature of Raman, but is there something we can do to re-engineer that concept so that we can increase the scattering signal while still being practical about it? Uh, and the answer to that really lies in plasmonics. So tutorial number two, let's look at what plasmonics is. Um, so noble me metal nanostructures. Let's consider a very simplified case here of a noble metal sphere. Um, by the nature of metals, um, any metal nanostructure is going to have a very high surface density of electrons. All those electrons are going to sit at the surface. If an electromagnetic field is incident upon that 
nanostructure, the oscillating electric field, it's going to cause those electrons that are mobile to move up and down. If you happen to have a geometry of the nanostructure that is a good match with the frequency of that incident light coming from your laser, you actually get an oscillating resonant dipole here. And based on that extremely high surface density of nanoparticles, turns out that's a huge enhancement of the electric field at the surface. Up to, in the case of spheres, you can get up to about a thousand times enhancement of the electric field immediately at the surface. Uh, for more, con uh, more complex geometries, you can actually get an even larger enhancement at the surface. So ultimately what this means is that if I have my target analyte directly on the surface, it's as if I have this huge amplifier there that I can have just a normal laser, but that analyte itself is feeling several orders of magnitude enhancement to that laser. So that's going to cause a lot more Raman scattered photons, and now we can actually pick that up even for trace, uh, uh, trace conditions. So, so the surface of needle type ship structures are good? Yes. So sharp structures are better. Um, and we use aggregated spheres so we can get those mm -hmm. kind of sharp Above features. Can presumably make them. Yep. So uh, we have a professor here who makes cubes, for right. example, and those are nice structures. Right. Right. So just to look at how powerful this can be, even 15 years ago, so SIRS as a field is about 40 years old. About 15 years ago, a uh, few different researchers actually were able to identify a single molecule using SIRS. Um, so for the first 25 years of SIRS, it was kind of, kind of a fringe chemist thing to do. Um, when these two papers came out, the bandwagon was rolling um, and people started jumping on. So um, over that time now, uh, many, many research groups have been looking at all of these different chemical components using SIRS and you know, shamelessly we jumped on that same bandwagon as well as soon as we could. Um, and so lots of chemical detection applications, as we'll talk about later, there are also uh, ways to detect macromolecules as well. Uh, for purposes of multiplexing and ultimately leading towards diagnostics. Um, but this is where the bulk of the work started out was, hey, what's another chemical we can detect with SIRS for some unique application? And, and in reality, just as kind of an informal side note, um, of course we want to compare SIRS with HPLC-MS just because I talked about it. Reality is HPLC-MS will always be more sensitive and will always be more specific. So from my perspective, the only way that SIRS is really going to get out there and going to get used is if we take it out into the field where we can't take HPLC-MS. It's never going to replace it. So that's really where my focus is. So let's see if everybody else has the same kind of mentality as I do anyway. Go ahead. What's the typical detection time for the SIRS? How long does it take? Seconds. Seconds. Yeah. So How does that compare to other methods? So with chemical detection, often the limiting factor can be getting the sample to the sensor and waiting for the necessary diffusion to occur. Right. This has this, those exact same limitations. So um, depending on how you need to interface that environmental aspect with your sensor, all the time that that takes based on how you've engineered your system is ultimately the, the limiting factor. So, and we'll even consider what our paper system does to that aspect of it. So once the analyte is on the nanoparticle, it's instant. But getting the analyte to the nanoparticle is the challenge. So let's see what the current mentality is for SIRS then. And keeping in mind this idea of taking SIRS out in the field. So here's what you can buy. Um, I can go on the web right now and buy a SIRS device. Um, this is about a hundred bucks. Um, and I can do a measurement with that. Um, so this is a metal nanostructured substrate produced in a clean room using nanofabrication techniques. Um, and this is, well, this is Gary Rubeloff's spectrometer. Um, so I'll, I'll mention that. This is kind of a, a common Raman spectrometer configuration of you know, what we've seen over the last 15 years, where you've got a microscope that's about a $100,000 microscope hooked up to another system that's anywhere from $100,000 to $300,000 or so. So in most of the papers that get published, this is what SIRS looks like, this particular combination. Um, well, this really puts us into a research lab still, not even a central lab, because nobody's going to want to know whether that apple is contaminated for a hundred bucks. Um, so this just doesn't really make sense. So 
Let's think about, to see if we can get there, let's focus on what's really needed for that concept of on-site detection. So what I see that as meaning is handheld equipment, so not that giant spectrometer. Now the spectrometer companies are actually paying attention. So over the last year, um, I would say there have been about 10 new handheld spectrometers that have hit the market. So they're at least thinking about it. Um, so the performance isn't as great, so we have to keep in mind the effect of that. Um, but we are seeing this concept of the handheld Raman spectrometer is coming out. Um, we also need single-use disposable devices. Um, commercially, we're still stuck at this point where the substrates cost 100 bucks each. So it's hard for me to envision that I'm going to go out and do these on-site tests for $100 unless it's really, really important. Um, there's a lot of people, of course, talking about microfluidics to get out there, I being one of them. Um, but at least today, these microsystems are still too expensive for the types of applications we're talking about. We want that to change, but if we just focus on today, I don't think it's there yet. It's probably better than this, but it's not quite there yet. Um, one of the other key aspects about all the microfluidic work that's going on in this field. Um, we want to go out in the field, I say a handheld spectrometer and a single-use device. Somebody says, hey, I have those two. And I say, what else is necessary? Well, I have this syringe pump and these air tanks for actuation and so on and so forth. So we don't want that. We don't want to have to carry a lot of other peripherals out there with us to control this little tiny device. You might have made the device small, but what else is necessary to drag along behind it? So we want to avoid that. Go ahead. Why, why are the microsystems too expensive today? I mean, you're not using a lot of metal, <coughs> I assume, in this. Is it just low quantities yeah. that are being produced in? Yeah. So Ideally, you could scale that. And yeah. So that. if that can be scaled, I think where you'd be looking at is um, getting down to maybe 10 bucks per. Really? It's still that expensive. So in order to make a good profit. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, so we'll, we'll even, we can even talk about profit margins, actually, when we get to the paper devices and, and think about that. Are you familiar with the polychromic, polychromics with the Steve Centurio's famous portable spectrometer. Yeah, I, so I, supposed to be the I, biggest I, I, I don't know where that is right now, yeah, but yeah, I remember that. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. too bad. Yeah, but um, I don't know what some of the reasons that you listed there, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Definitely cost was one of them. Mm -hmm. So one other thing to think about, these devices that you buy, just metal nanostructures, we want noble metals, and so they do have a shelf life, so that's also something to think about. Um, but the biggest issues, one of the big issues in my mind, right now commercially available, 100 bucks. Um, if I want to move to microfluidics or some other micro device, it needs to be kind of a standalone component. Um, so we're not there yet. And I will say that my group also does work on microfluidics for chemical and biomolecule detection. So we do hope to get that uh, so that it's practical as well. Um, so here's what we do just to look at the difference of what's necessary and then our solution. So instead of nanofabrication, uh, we use inkjet printing. So we make an ink that contains noble metal nanostructures and pattern that onto a substrate by inkjet printing instead of by nanolithography. Um, as a substrate, we use paper. So this is a piece of paper that's been run through a printer and had silver nanoparticles printed onto it. So here you see this clustered nanoparticles essentially embedded into that cellulose matrix. So how much control do you have over the geometry? So we draw a picture and we print it, honestly. Okay. But the 3D geometry, not a lot of control because it depends on this, the cellulose. Do, right. Yeah, okay, so, so do you, right. Right. The, the geometry of say this aggregate or well, you aggregate and then also the minimum feature size, you know, the okay. exact yeah. dimension right. that you want. Yeah. You know, so that, on the yeah, so that all comes down to how much you're willing to pay for the printer as well. Uh -huh. But there's going to be a limit in the feature size based on the fact that you're printing a wet ink that is going to spread some amount based on what you're printing it on to. I see. Um, the scale on that? Yes. So this is, um, this, each little tick is one micron here. Um, so nanoparticles, each one of those little nanoparticles is about uh, 80 nanometers or so. Um, again, just to give you another point of reference there. Um, so we showed, so these, and these spots here, that's about a one millimeter spot. 
So we just drew one millimeter circles on a computer, printed that out, and made and sensors one millimeter. Is your substrate flexible substrate? Can it be like a band aid pipe? Yeah, so um, we're using just filter paper that you can buy from Fisher in huge boxes. Right. Um, some key aspects to the substrates. It cannot contain any chemical compounds that have optical properties. So we can't use printer paper for this because it has all these chemical binders and agents that make it look nice and white and so forth. Um, in fact, just for fun, when we published the first paper, um, we screened everything we could think of. Coffee filters, toilet paper, paper towels, napkins. Nothing worked because they all have some kind of chemical binder in there. Pure cellulose, pure nitrocellulose, those are fine because they don't have that much optical fluorescence associated with them. Um, so this is just cellulose filter paper here. Um, but there are certainly a lot of possibilities as long as there's no optical background element in there that's going to cause problems. What about using something like Teflon or some kind of plastic? Yeah, so um, we'll get into a little bit more why we like paper so much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we could use rigid materials as well as long as we could get the uh, nanoparticles to absorb, stick, somehow. In this case, the nanoparticles get embedded into the fibers pretty well and become immobilized yeah. that way. If we, so we actually found that if we use very tight, pore paper, yeah. um, the nanoparticles don't stick very well. So there's kind of a nice pore size to get the nanoparticles in, but then they don't move anymore after that. Okay. Does that increase, do you have an increased diffusion because of the the characteristics of the paper? There? So if, if that we haven't found a pore size that is so large that the nanoparticles move through the pores very much. Uh, maybe to a very small degree, but not anything that's of significance to us. Um, especially ultimately as when you see how we do our sensing, you'll see that um, the movement of the nanoparticles wouldn't be so much, wouldn't cause a problem in a lot of the things that we actually do. Can you change the, the metal type and mask the area and, and make structures of different types of metals? Um, so people have, th there's a whole field emerged in paper-based biosensors that do photolithography on paper. Mm -hmm. um, so in our case, we wanted to do dirty, cheap, easy to use, no clean room fab whatsoever. Um, but yeah, other people have, a Whitesides group has done photolithography on, on paper. Okay, so just to highlight two major advantages as, uh, of this as well, first starting with one. Um, so obviously, as opposed to that $100 device, there's no clean room, no expertise needed for that. The idea here is that you buy the ink, anybody could make it. Um, uh, if you're interested, by the way, in all the business aspects, it turns out that selling the ink, I was told, is not a way to make money. Um, we can talk about that. Um, but at any rate, that was my vision for, for the, the philosophy of all this. Um, uh, so very low cost just based on what it takes to produce these and the materials that go into it. Um, all of the work we've done in our lab is based on this Epson desktop printer. Um, this is 60 bucks at Staples. Um, you, you use I'll tell you exactly why. <laughs> Yeah, so, it, it, right, it, everybody assumes that the funding we get from Canon pays for this. In reality, um, But Ep that's a million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> Epson is the only company that produces consumer printers with piezo actuators. Uh, everybody else uses bubble jet. Okay. Um, and we prefer, so Canon and HP are actually the same thing. Um, they have some kind of agreements that, so, and everybody else does bubble jet. Epson actually puts a piezo in their consumer printers. We thought piezos would give us a lot more flexibility to be able to print anything we wanted to without having to worry about the conditions to make a bubble actuator. Um, so that's why we, we chose Epson and, and have stuck with it. There are companies that sell sophisticated piezo inkjet heads. It's a company called Microfab that you can buy uh, piezo inkjet heads and make your own printer. And there are, you know, printers, inkjet printers with piezo heads that can cost up to two or three hundred thousand um, dollars. So when you talk about quality of printing and so forth, there's certainly a scale. We actually started out just, hey, let's see if this works. 
and it worked, so we stuck with it, basically. Um, but uh, again, when we talk about the commercialization, we can talk a little bit more about printer options. Um, but using inkjet printing and, and specifically piezo, um, so we're basically just injecting particles into paper to create these nanostructures. Um, we can actually use the same printer to print hydrophobic features, so we can control where the sample can go and where the sample can't go on a piece of paper, and we've done that. Um, and where we really are right now is now also in addition to plasmonically functionalizing the paper, also biofunctionalizing the paper using the same printer. So making inks that actually deliver biomolecules to the paper so that we can do diagnostics that way. Um, okay, so just the initial experimental validation. Um, so here's a couple fungicides. Uh, Thyrum is used in pr produce a lot, malachite green is a fungicide used in fish farms, and BPE is just a, another nice uh, SERS molecule. Um, so with BPE, uh, we've gotten down to uh, four picogram detection of it. Um, one of the things I do want to highlight, if you're a sensors person, if you took my class, for example, um, you might recognize this as the Langmuir isotherm. So normally when you're doing SIRS, people always complain about the random nature of SIRS, that it's not a very quanti quantitative technique. Um, the techniques we use actually sacrifice performance a little bit to get this repeatability, reproducibility, and, and quantification. So we can actually show a good fit with that Lang Langmuir isotherm, which explains mathematically how molecules absorb onto a surface. So we're very happy that we can generally, in our, in our work, uh, even on these paper devices, get that, and also get good trace detection of, of good molecules. One interesting thing here, so this is just showing cellulose versus nitrocellulose. Um, so commonly we talk about cellulose, but there's lots of membranes that work. Um, but what's interesting is it always needs to be optimized for what you're detecting. So in the case of malachite green, that nitrocellulose apparently binds malachite green very well and doesn't allow it to interact with the nanoparticles. So it's not good enough to be close. You've got to be on the silver, on the gold, to get it to work. Um, and here BPE shows a different behavior where it actually works a little bit better with nitrocellulose than with cellulose. So, and like I say, there are a lot of other membranes to play around with as well. Um, so this really just illustrates a very simple idea of replacing that commercial sensor just by printing one out on paper and using it that way. Um, but that doesn't really capture what I like the most about using paper, actually. Um, it's cheap. That's nice in one sense. Um, but where paper really comes and kind of surpasses those rigid devices is in its ability to move fluids and in its ability to be flexible. Um, so we can collect water samples, any, anything wet, with a simple dipstick operation. Um, and we can also compare this concept to microfluidics as well. Um, and of course, seems relatively obvious, but because of the flexibility of paper, we can use it as a swab. As compared to that silicon device that's been nanofabricated, it would be hard to imagine taking that and swabbing a very complex surface that we could do with paper. So really, these two um, features start to separate paper a little bit based on its functionality. And this is where I kind of look at it as, instead of having several components to do several things, can I get one component that does everything the system needs? Um, so let's look at breaking that down. So a very simple example, uh, we make a, a sensor that looks like this. Here you've got nanoparticles printed here. Um, and again, going after that fungicide that is regulated for fish farm applications, dip it in water, um, and we could, this is one ppb, um, and you can very easily see it. So we can actually get below the parts per billion level um, for this particular fungicide. Just by, again, dip it straight in the water, and detect it. Um, I, I kind of, it's sometimes fun to imagine the analog for either the silicon devices or microfluidic devices. So I've got a microfluidic sensor and I've got water and I have to figure out how am I going to get this water into this little spot. So there's this classic world to chip interface problem that the microfluidics people always have to think about. I've got pumps, I've got interconnects that have pressure limitations and leakages and so forth. Paper, I just literally dip it in the water and I measure it. So in terms of thinking about how long does this take, so 30 seconds is basically your answer there. Um, or it could take one second if the concentration is a little bit higher. So is this using your Google 
pulse spectrometer? Oh, oh, thanks for calling me out on that. Um, no, I should have mentioned, um, so everything I show here is using the newer handheld, smaller devices. So we have one in our lab that is about this big. Um, I should, okay, so that doesn't have the laser in it, so add a diode laser to this big. Still. Which company is this? So we use an ocean optic spectrometer right now. Um, we bought another one from another smaller outfit, but we started with Ocean Optics. They gave us a lot of moral and financial support in the beginning, and also made a significant investment in the startup company that came out of this work. Um, so we've had a, a relationship with them for a while. So Methods publishes all sorts of methods, or only the micro? Yeah. So everything, everything they, they publish. This is by invitation only, I should mention. You should put that back. Well, yeah, it's not that prestigious of a journal. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so they have issues featuring different things. At, before I knew that it was invitation only, I thought, oh man, what a great journal to send stuff to. We have lots of methods, right? Um, but no, they have well, special... Is it, mainly, is it mainly biomedical or all sorts? Uh, I I think it, right now, from what I saw the last several issues, it seems to have a, a biomedical okay. lean to it. Very good. Um, but yeah, this was actually Dr. Harold in bioengineering was the editor of that, so, mm -hmm. so we got an invitation to c contribute this work to that. Um, so the swab, um, again, you can imagine how this works. So this is nanoparticles printed onto the tip of a piece of paper. Grab it here, wipe anything you want to. So thiram is a fungicide used on produce. So here the idea is you wipe the surface of produce with the sensor. Um, and then in this case, uh, because you're actually swabbing and relying on how much you can pick up, you know, probably the detection limit's not gonna be as great. But we're still able, if we deposit 10 nanograms onto a surface, we are still able to uh, detect that using these paper devices. Um, so that just shows this idea of sample application to the sensor. So no pumps, no world of chip interface, you just directly hit the sample with the paper and pick it up. Um, another advantage of the paper is the idea that because I can move fluids on there, I can actually do a concentration with this. So imagine I've dipped this piece of paper in water or I swabbed a sample. I've got analytes everywhere throughout the paper, but I'm using a laser for detection. So I'm really only detecting one little tiny spot. So, but if I take this piece of paper, and I dip it into a solvent. What's gonna happen is that solvent will get wicked into the paper and continually evaporate out the top, so it'll keep moving up and up the paper. And if I choose the right solvent, my analyte is gonna be mobile in that solvent. So ultimately, after a short time period, I can take everything from that vast area and put it into a small area. So this is using a die just to illustrate how tightly you can ultimately concentrate that. Um, so just as an example, this was using, uh, again, one of these uh, model molecules used for, for Raman and SIRS a lot, and we got a 24x enhancement between that first sample application and then doing the concentration effect. Um, so that's now sample application and then concentration to improve detection limit. Were you going to ask a question? Well, I, yeah, I was going to say, how is this compared to the, to the generic samples that people make? this results if you compare what you're measuring to something that traditionally made. What do you mean by traditionally made? Do you mean like, on the, like ha, ha, how's our performance right, compared? Right, so, so, all right, so little story. So that $100 device. Yeah. So um, when the, I'll talk about the startup that came out of this, but two grad students in the lab started a company, spun it out. So Ocean Optics invited them down to the headquarters in Florida and said, bring some of your paper sensors. We want to compare yours with this $100 device. And we won. So it's comparable without the concentration effects, but when you add in the concentration effects, then it actually won. So it seems as though the paper concept of fluid movement and being able to do concentration actually put it over the, the limit there. And so these cost a few cents to make, and the guys want to sell them for a couple bucks. Hmm. So think about the markup involved. Wow. <laughs> so when you're asking about microfluidic devices, yeah, I think you can make them for a buck or two. But then somebody says, well, that means I'm going to sell them for 15 bucks each. And then, oh, wait a second. <laughs> so yeah, when I, I thought these would be sold for like 10 cents or something, they said, no, at least a buck, maybe two bucks. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. That's a huge markup, of course. Um, so at any rate, 
sample collection, sample concentration. Um, but let's, again, I want, always want to focus on being practical here. So in the real world, so people who do ramen like me will tell you that it's unbelievably specific and that's just great. Um, but in reality, with real world samples, and everything you've seen so far was one analyte in water or in some liquid system or deposit onto a surface. Obviously that's not real. Um, so what's real is that we work with samples that uh, may have lots of proteins in them that will actually foul the surface of the nanoparticles so your analyte doesn't get to them. Um, there may be lots of components that have Raman signatures and you may have some overlaps that make it difficult to tease out. And you may also have uh, components in the sample. So I talked about how if you choose the wrong paper you get too much fluorescence. You could have, actually have a sample that has too much fluorescence. We'll look at an example of that. So because of that, that makes Raman very challenging to do in the real world. Um, so ultimately people use a sample cleanup and usually that's somewhere else in the system. We collect the sample, we clean it up, we load it into the device, we do detection. Um, maybe you remember from middle school or grade school doing chromatography on paper. So the idea is we can actually use that paper to separate out the components of the sample before we detect it. So again, single device that performs multiple functions to come together in a system. So we can apply a sample, do chromatography to separate out various components, even do 2D chromatography if we need to, and then dice up that device, do the concentration, the detection. So two quick real world examples to illustrate this. Um, so you might remember a few years ago the, the big melamine problem in China um, when some uh, children were getting sick and dying from infant formula that was spiked with melamine. Um, so melamine can certainly be detected with traditional chemical analysis techniques, but the most expensive part is the sample cleanup. Um, getting the melamine separated out from the proteins, the lipids, and the milk. Um, so what we did, we took a, a PVDF membrane. So this is different from cellulose. This is PVDF, which actually has very strong protein binding capabilities. So if we put a spot of infant formula, so this is real infant formula now, spiked with uh, uh, melamine here, and try to do ramen on this spot, um, that's this red line. Um, we can't see the melamine there. Um, but we can get a hint of what's happening. There's kind of this, this coffee ring out here to the outside where the protein didn't diffuse, but other components in the formula did. If we hit that spot, we actually start to see the melamine peak. But then we do chromatography with the mobile phase, and we scan the length of this, and at this spot right here, we have this huge melamine peak. So again, if we scan along the device, you can see back here is where all those protein components are, and the melamine has migrated away from there, and now we can easily find that. So, um, again, commercially right now, it's this very complicated sample separation process. We just used a simple membrane, dipping in the right solvent, and separated it out and detected it. So why melamine is migrating? So melamine is a small molecule, yeah. um, whereas all these proteins are getting stuck on the PVDF. Okay. So melamine, and you pick the right mobile phase that melamine is soluble in and won't stick to the membrane. So you can't just use anything water probably wouldn't have worked, but you choose the right mobile phase that you have good solubility for what you want and not for what you don't want, and you get that separation. Yes? Have you gotten to blood yet? So uh, we have, blood is an application that we're looking at as the follow-up to this. Um, so there's a, a few people talking about this application and, and some SBIRs are out there about this, of doing, uh, looking at drug load in blood over time. So identifying, so that's a case where you look at a small molecule in blood. Um, so we look at it as essentially trying to do the exact same thing. So finding drugs that are good matches for doing SIRS and then finding the right mobile phase. Um, so a spectrometer company has actually asked us to collaborate with them on that. So it's one of those next steps to follow up. Um, so here's another maybe fun example. So two independently, two spectroscopy companies came to us and said we're trying to sell our ramen, handheld ramen systems to police to identify narcotics. Uh -huh. And in our lab we, we buy heroin standards and it works great. We go to the police, they say well here's something we got from the street. Do it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so you can buy, you, you can actually buy heroin. We buy heroin. We buy from cocaine. The streets, or? Not from the streets, no. Um, it would, be che it would be much cheaper. Okay. So, so there, there's, there's a company that sells 
heroin. It's, it's owned by Sigma. Um, they sell all you have a license any drug. Or you have to get the, the, the key is they sell it for tens of dollars by the milligram, uh -huh. which is about five thousand times more expensive than what you'd pay on the street. Okay, because so, we work with TNT and we have to work under Bill Forney's license. Right, so, so if you buy so enough... So for, for yeah. learning, you don't need it. Yeah, so they, they asked a couple questions and they said, okay, fine, you uh -huh. seem okay. But yeah, the, the, the <laughs> cost, be, be, TNT is hard to get on the corner in Baltimore, but right. they figure nobody would buy, pay this much to get high when you can drive up to Baltimore and get high for 5,000 times cheaper. So probably there's no problem with selling it to you. So here's the problem. Street drugs have so many cutting agents, they white out the CCD on the spectrometer. Too much fluorescence. Um, so these two spectrometer co companies came to us and said, what can we do about that? So we used our chromatography concept. So here's an illustration. If we put the cutting agent and the heroin in this one spot, you just get a flat line of saturation on your CCD because of all the fluorescence. You do the chromatography, you get a flat line here, and now you get the separated out heroin there. So again, here you can see the saturation now separated from the heroin. This is one of the things that's interesting about paper chromatography to look at though. Um, this heroin peak is now spread across a full centimeter. So it's been diluted down and we don't want that. So we cut the device up, um, do that concentration, and here you can see now the peak emerging much stronger after the concentration step. Um, and again, fitting the Langmuir curve with our data, um, I would say this is not as quantifiable as the previous experiment, but that's to be expected because we've got so many variables in this. Um, and we got down, we could still see as, as low as 25 nanograms of heroin deposited onto the paper to do that. Um, so just to summarize, um, the keys here, it's a low cost, but maybe more importantly, um, it's so much easier to use than anything you'd be able to buy right now. Um, so recently this actually did make the cover of one of the analytical chemistry journals. This is the RSC uh, analytical chemistry journal. Um, and again, just to focus on the pragmatic nature. I'm a professor. Everything I do, I'm going to tell you it is the most practical thing ever. Um, most of the time it's not true, but in this case I think it really does have a good story. Um, so these two guys in my group, um, uh, I said I wasn't interested in starting a company. They said, well, we are, so we'll do it. Um, so they started a company called Diagnostic Answers um, and they've gotten uh, some nice investments uh, including some help from Ocean Optics and they actually have a, a customer, a major customer lined up and, and ready to go. So um, this appears as though it is actually going to take off this chemical detection aspect. Um, so me, us as a lab we kind of view, okay, the chemical detection that was our entry point, get us some papers, make sure it works. Now let's try to do something more interesting. Um, so then we get into trying to figure out how to use these devices for diagnostics. I'm probably way over time, so I'll okay. try to speed through this. Um, so SIRS for chemical analysis is pretty obvious. You get this nice signature from a small molecule, so it's a good fit. It's really a bad fit, uh, theoretically speaking or philosophically speaking, when we think of macromolecules. So proteins, nucleic acids, these are big molecules that are just repeating elements of small subunits. Proteins are made up of lots of amino acids. Nucleic acids are made up of lots of nucleotides. Um, we can, amino acids are good matches with SIRS, but proteins tend to be way less specific. Um, so the question would be why would anybody want to try to use, or how would we use Raman and SIRS with these molecules, and, and why would we? Um, so this is a, a concept published by Chad Merkin from Northwestern a little more than a decade ago trying to tout how to use SIRS. Um, so this is a DNA hybridization assay where you've got an immobilized probe. Um, here's your target sequence that hybridizes there. And then you've got another probe that has hanging off of it a nanoparticle with these uh, small molecules that have a good Raman spectrum attached to that nanoparticle. So that if this target sequence is present, you'll build up this structure at your surface, then you hit it with your laser and you see the Raman spectrum. Um, we can imagine extrapolating that, and other professors have done this, other research groups, to proteins as well, where you use antibodies instead of nucleic acids to visualize a protein on the surface. And the idea is, if there's no protein or no target sequence in your sample, you don't see SIRS. Um, now this structure is basically the same thing that we would use if we were doing fluorescence detection or an ELISA 
where we have a, a colorimetric readout. So again, the question is why SIRS? So going back to Merkin's first illustration of this, why should we use SIRS? If we have fluorescence, fluorophores generally have a relatively broad emission. And if we want to multiplex fluorophores, we've got multiple filters to change out. We've got to have either a broadband source or multiple lasers if we want to do fluorescent, if we want to do laser excited fluorescence. Um, with SIRS, um, the peaks are very narrow band. So from my telecom background, I like to say I like to describe this as narrow band. Um, so Merkin showed that they could easily detect simultaneously six different DNA sequences because of that narrow band nature. One laser, one detector, one filter, but six different targets um, because of that narrow band nature of SIRS. Um, so that really suggests that if we want to do a low cost on-site detection where I've just got one spot to look at, I can get uh, Merkin showed up to six and they hypothesized that they could do a lot more. Um, other groups have followed up with similar conclusions as well. So the idea is really get to get to multiplexing. So there are two different parallel projects that we've done along this line, and I'll only focus on one here. So one of them has essentially combined the paper-based SIRS sensors with a common pervasive technique, polymerase chain reaction, to do uh, genetic diagnosis or infectious disease diagnosis. Um, so that is, is leveraging PCR plus SIRS. Um, another assay that we're looking at is doing a direct assay on a paper strip here, and that's the one I'll talk about. So we call this competitive displacement. Um, and so the concept basically looks like this. So I've got a piece of paper here. Um, I use my inkjet printer to print my nanoparticles there. And then I use my inkjet printer to print this structure. So this is, the green is a DNA probe that is fixed onto the surface here. And the red one is a hybridized probe with, I would say, moderate affinity. And that moderate affinity being the key here. And then that probe has a molecule on here that is a good SIRS target. Um, now, if I apply my sample here, if I have something in this sample that has high affinity for that green probe, remember this had moderate affinity, and biochemistry we can displace something through just uh, the random nature uh, of molecular interactions, that high affinity molecule can actually displace that moderate affinity molecule. So I apply the sample, that sample is going to flow along the paper strip, and again, if that element in my sample has higher affinity, I can knock off my reporter, that reporter flows along the paper because I've got this big pad to keep drawing that sample across, and now I've got my molecule onto my SIRS detection. So, if we go back to what people used to do, um, one, rinse, two, rinse, three, rinse, detect. Seven steps. Apply, detect. Two steps. Really only one step of preparation. So again, this, the reason we designed the assay this way is because we don't want to have to keep apply, rinse, apply, rinse, apply, rinse. Especially because rinsing is not an easy thing to do on a piece of paper. Um, and it takes a long time. These rinses typically take anywhere from 5 to 30 minutes. We don't want that. We want apply sample, couple minutes, detect. So that's the philosophy of, of this. And again, I really look at this as how do I design this simple thing to perform everything that a system needs to perform. Okay, so again, stepping back through there. So this is in progress. What I'm going to show you instead is the microfluidic implementation of that. Um, so just to understand the biosensing aspect of that, we first did it in microfluidics. So here's a microfluidic device. <coughs> um, and this work actually uh, is at, in revision, but in reality it's going back to the editor right now. Very minor comments, so this one's going to get published. And uh, Sarushu did this. This will be his fourth paper, and he's defending in two weeks. So uh, well done by him. Um, so this is the microfluidic nature of it. So we're essentially using packed silica beads to mimic the porous nature of paper. Um, so at the inlet here to our microfluidic device, we've got our sample which contains that DNA target. And within these packed silica microspheres, this is what the microsphere looks like. So this green-red pairing there, that's that probe and reporter that we just saw on the previous slide. And where you see the blue, that's where the target has displaced the reporter. In this case, displaced reporters will flow down the channel. 
will be mixed in the microfluidic mixer with nanoparticles where we can then they get stuck in this bed here because the nanoparticles won't flow through the bed. DNA molecules by themselves will flow through this bed but nanoparticles get stuck. So we uh, use some electrostatics to get this pairing to occur then they get stuck there and then we can do our multiplex detection at that point. So the injured printing is not in the game. Right, so here we're doing a, a classic microfluidic classic device to, sh to show the idea. Yes. Um, and fortunately people will still publish that too. Um, so uh, one of the things we needed to figure out, which was nice to have the microfluidic device to do, was that moderate affinity. So what I need is for my target to displace my reporter. So we designed three different reactions here in which in each case the number of base matches between this probe and reporter changed, whereas the number of base matches with the target and probe was the same. Um, so here we've got a very strong binding between probe and reporter, here very weak, and here the moderate. Um, so if I look at this first case, what happens is, so remember the reporter has a fluorophore on it so I can look at the fluorescence of it. So in this case I get lots of reporter onto my uh, structure here, um, but then when I add the target, not very much gets knocked off, just a little bit. Um, so here's your papa bear. If I look at the mama bear, um, I've just got a very small amount, and that's not enough affinity. So I can't even get my reporter on there in the first place, so I don't get a good signal there either. Um, but if I use this moderate case that's just right, I get a good amount of reporter stuck on there, but it has a low enough affinity that my target displaces it. So now I've got good signal contrast between the first and second case. So that's what we want. Um, so then Sarush moved on and did the experiments here. Um, so looking at increasing concentrations of target DNA, we get a good Langmuir line fit again. So 100 picomolar DNA, um, and we still got a nice uh, SIRS signal there. Um, what was key though is getting the multiplex detection. That's why we wanted to use SIRS. So now he's, in this case, he's done an experiment in which he had two different DNA sequences where two different reporters labeled by two different molecules. Um, now it turns out R6G and Tamra are very close to each other, so um, we need to be able to tease those apart, and you can see peaks in here that are unique to either one or the other, so we can verify that multiplexing. There are a lot of molecules that are much more distant from these two that makes the multiplexing even easier. Um, so again, using Merkin's hypothesis, we can get up to six. Others have suggested that through some other chemical techniques, we can get beyond six there. Um, so just looking to the future, um, just a couple ideas that, that we have. Um, so, uh, transparent paper. So everything I've talked about so far is just plain white filter paper. There's a guy in material science named Bing Hu. Um, he makes a cellulose-based paper that is transparent. So cellulose isn't white, right? Its paper is white because it's microstructured, so it scatters light, it appears white. Um, if you redesign the cellulose or re-engineer the cellulose, you can actually design it to be more transparent. So what we envision is actually doing an in situ synthesis of nanoparticles throughout the depth of a, a transparent paper. Everything we're doing right now, we've got a sample that is in the entire thickness of the paper and a detector that's at the top of the paper. So there's an inefficiency there. We'd like to be able to sense through the entire depth of the paper. Um, other things, so we talked in the, all the, the sample preparation things that we can do for chemical sensing, so we, we're now in the process of investigating that for biosensing. So we can take complex blood samples, for example, and filter out the cells that we don't want. Um, we could uh, lyse microorganisms by loading enzymes and other agents into the paper and storing them there. Um, we can do uh, protein DNA separations, um, separate small molecules from larger molecules we talked about. Um, and then one student in the group is actually looking at implementing nucleic acid amplification within paper instead of in a classic uh, commercial p uh, equipment. Um, so let's just skip the summary and go on and, and to the acknowledgments here. Uh, so V Moon was the first student to hack the, the Epson printer and get this process to work. Um, so he had four uh, first authored papers on paper SIRS. And Where is he now? So he just graduated a couple months ago. Um, but he stayed in the group for a few months because we have a MIPS program mm -hmm. and so he's finishing out that program. He will then join the startup company. So 
Um, Eric had some of the work there, so he's the president of the startup company. Um, he'll be graduating in maybe a month or two. Uh, Sarusha's defense is scheduled for October 23rd. Please come to that right here. Um, and Kristen is an undergraduate student that uh, worked with Sarusha a lot on actually doing the competitive displacement assay to go with his microfluidic components. Um, and also I'll acknowledge all the uh, funding supports. So, so NSF uh, gave me the career award to do a lot of this. Uh, Ocean Optics has given some cash and, and other support. Uh, MIPS and Diagnostic Answers are currently supporting some of this work right now as well. So I apologize for taking way too much of your time. I have no idea what time it is right now. Um, but I uh, hope it was worthwhile anyway. Excellent. Thank you. Is it time for a few questions? So I have two points. One question, mm -hmm. well, actually two comments. Mm -hmm. um, what is really intriguing to me here is this process that you have developed. And there's infinite opportunities in terms of the designs and mm -hmm. what students particularly can do. So what I would like to encourage you is to talk to Elizabeth Smello. Mm -hmm. Because Elizabeth published a paper in early 2000, I think 2002 or 2003, uh, which was presented at Hilton Head for the first time. Okay. And she literally brought the students to Hilton Head. They put a bench there and she demonstrated to everyone how simple this process is. The process became a, a standard protocol for one of the undergraduate lab in, at Stanford mm. that Roger Hall was using. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I'm getting at here is we have an opportunity here to use some of this mm -hmm. really simple processes like from your group, Elizabeth's group, maybe Don DeVos, mm -hmm. maybe Ben Shapiro, and turn it into a really exciting undergraduate. Yeah, level. that's a good point. I mean, and then really let the students go with their ideas. Yeah, so we try to tout that when we write proposals yeah. that anybody can do this. We can have our high school interns make devices right. for us. Right. Can you believe that? So yeah, yeah I completely yeah. agree. But that's I think a very we good have point. An opportunity here to make this. The second comment I have is, what kind of a feedback do you have for some of these folks who are sitting here, and some of them hopefully want to become a professor and someday? How do you get some of this crazy idea started and turn it into something like this? It's luck. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I would say it's, it's, obviously, it's, luck. it's obviously part luck, but part of it is just talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. I mean, this idea came out of another random idea that just came up and we're talking and talking and the students telling me, oh, I want to do this and that. And just, if you can do this, we can do that. Mm -hmm. We should try this. And if we can do that, then we can do this. And it just, so many conversations. So we just talk, you know, talking with the students over and over again for years. And we keep thinking, oh, well, if we can do fluidic transport, we could also do this. Right. Um, uh, the other thing, of course, the, the hardest thing to do is, as a professor, well, one of the hardest things is to read papers now. Um, so make your students and postdocs read lots and lots of papers. And do your best to keep up on it. But yeah, I mean, they, they really become the, the workforce in keeping you updated on what's new because, you know, there's only so much we can do. So, um, yeah, I think a, a lot of ideas start to emerge out of what other people are doing, of course, and one of the big challenges is how can I not do what they're doing and do it in a completely different way. So, we actually were starting to talk about this at the infancy when paper biosensors were just kind of coming out. And George Whitesides and Paul Yeager had published papers on paper biosensors. Right. And I had students suggesting we should do paper biosensors. And I said, well, we're not going up against Yeager and Whitesides. That's suicide. That's, exactly. that's not going to work out for, well for us in the end. But not necessarily following, but trying right. so, to So that's what ultimately happened is yeah. then we wanted to get in there. And then we thought, hey, those guys aren't going to do this. Mm. We'll be the first to do that. And being the first one in is always great for a young professor because then you can essentially be evolve to become the first and then ultimately the leader of that field. So I think that's one of those biggest things is you look at what's emerging and you say, I'm not going to copy you guys. I'm going to be the first to do it in a different way. So you find a different and importantly simpler way to do it. Um, and I think the other thing that's really helped us out is really thinking about everything as a system and not a device. Um, I worked as a postdoc for three years engineering sensors and our focus was on the sensor. And we 
tried to say they were practical sensors, of course, and better than other sensors, but in reality we ignored the system and the difficulties it takes to get the sample to the sensor. Um, so now we've got an argument as to why our sensor is better. It performs as well, but look at how easy it is to get the sample to the sensor, and that becomes a very powerful argument. So consider, that's always, that's been my biggest philosophy since getting here, is consider the whole system. It's too bad Mark Austin and John Barris are not here, they would have given you some and additional <laughs> comments. <laughs> <clears throat> Has Dave Lovell and Dan Lapshire talked to you about their sensor scores? Because that's the same philosophy. That yes. Yeah, so I teach a census course in bioengineering and, and also tout that, the same philosophy. And I gave a lecture when Elizabeth had a census course a couple years ago and also gave them But this is really special because creature. they're merging systems engineering and sensor course. So I, I didn't know about yeah, that one, no. This is, this is the first time they're offering this course together. And, uh, and I think it's a really nice approach to mm -hmm. some of this example. Mm -hmm. Am I the only one talking? I guess I am. Okay, thank you. <laughs>so I, th I think this is this is really an opportunity yeah I, I, I agree for, with for you maybe you're leading it because I think each of us has something to contribute mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. and and if you take like two or three different uh, or four of these processes and teach them the mm -hmm. first month then the following months is you know create your yeah, own design. you guys do something with right it. right so you have like two or three CAN projects. Hopefully that won't take students away from your course. <laughs> yeah, those devices in Godsey's course are so hard to make. But if you take well, that other one. We actually bring this next time to the class and, 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 and get you involved. So can we detect clozapine? That's what I want to ask. Huh? So, so the nice thing is it's super easy to try. Yeah, but this is, I mean, this really got my attention. So I was intrigued about how practical is it to basically take the, after you do the separation mm -hmm. on the paper, to take back the molecules back into outside of the paper. Nice. To do the t testing Same like enough, huh? with, uh, yeah. with electrodes basically outside. So first of all, you could put the electrodes on the paper. Um, if you want to take it off the paper, it's often going to cause you a huge dilution. Okay. So you've got the analyte concentrated in, say, a relatively small spot. To really elute it off of there, then you're going to have to elute into hundreds of microliters to get a good elution. And then you've so lost a 100x concentration factor, probably. I see. So like the, putting them very, very close to the, to the electrode it won't be enough. You have to have some kind of... Yeah, if you could electrophoretically move it out of the paper somehow, then maybe. I see. But if you're just expecting it to diffuse out of the paper, I think you're going to tremendously dilute it in the process. Okay. Even with a good solvent. Yeah. That's, that's my guess. Yeah. Good. But what, what Greg and I were talking about back in the day was just putting the electrodes on the paper. And how, how we, was it? Well, I mean, you, so yeah, in fact, lots of people have done that. Um, which is really where this idea came from, is my grad student said, hey, we can inkjet print electrodes onto paper. Absolutely. And, you know. But I think other people have done it. Yeah, so White, Whiteside's group had painted electrodes, yeah. and so yeah. his only yes. niche was inkjet printing. I was like, that's not enough. Right. But wait a second, tell me more about the inkjet stuff. And that's where this idea essentially came from. So yeah, pe people have done, mostly they just make an ink and then kind of paint it on. So Ji Hong Ni in chemistry, who I may have mentioned to you. So he was one of the first to have done this on paper. And he basically synthesized an ink that he could paint onto paper and then made an electrochemical sensor out of it. Yeah, it could be, I mean, one thing that maybe we can use this as kind of a separation way mm -hmm. and then interface with our sensor. So that's something we very mm -hmm. Separation? Yes. Separate separation. So the other thing you could possibly do if you had some kind of simple